Well, it's good to see you in chapel this morning. Good to have Brian as our guest today. I'm glad you're looking at seminary. Praise the Lord for that. I had a big day yesterday. Went up to Tupelo and then Cenotopia and met with uh, one of our new trustees, Buddy Switzer, or I'm sorry, Buddy Smith at uh, AFR. And Buddy's excited about being a new trustee at Wesley Biblical Seminary. He's the executive vice president of American Family Radio. And he sends his greetings to everybody. Matt, he especially wanted to be remembered to you. And Don sends his greetings to you. I was able to visit with Don for about 15 minutes and saw his uh, plaque where Don Wildman was given the, doc the honorary doctorate from Wesley Biblical in 1994, 20 years ago. So that was, that was really neat and uh, had a good day. Was able to visit with uh, uh, another, another minister in the area who has real interest in the seminary. Then went up to Cenotopia and visited with Jeff Switzer. Jeff founded Mississippi Fellowship of United Methodist Evangelicals, and he's going to be working with us, trying to get the mailing list for that group so we can reach out to them and promote our doctorate of ministries within, within the ranks of the Mississippi Fellowship of United Methodist Evangelicals. That's an incredible opportunity for us, and we really want to seize that initiative right now. Talked with his youth pastor, who is... Uh, interested in attending Wesley Biblical Seminary. Yes. So I've passed that information on to Rob. and We're seeing good things happen. I hope you have a great spring break. I won't have a spring break. I will be away. Um, I, I leave for Kentucky on Saturday. I'm excited, though. I'll get to spend about three or four nights at my little cabin in the woods in the mountains. And that's, I, I, I'd love to share it with some of y'all. I've, I've offered it to Matt and his family when he goes up to Wilmore. And, and I've been able to share it with lots of people. Um, so if you're, if you're interested in talking to me about a vacation, if I like you, I'll give it to you. <laughs> So, but Beth and I will be up there. I'll be preaching Sunday at Five Mile Community Church with Tom Lorimer and see a lot of friends and loved ones there. And then uh, Monday I have to take care of some business locally. Tuesday I'll be preaching in chapel at Kentucky Mountain Bible College, meeting in Louisville that evening with one of our longtime um, significant supporters of the seminary, large supporters, large donors. And so pray that that's a real positive meeting. We've been friends for a lot of years, and I want to advance that friendship and partnership, God being our helper. Wednesday of next week, I'll be at the um, headquarters of the Wesleyan Church in Fishers, Indiana, meeting with some of their leadership, and Gary has lots of friends there, um, but I uh, want to promote the seminary with a, put a face to us. You know, they were, the, the most recent memory some of those folks have is WBS is dead, and so we've got to go in and, and tell them we're live. We're live to God be the glory. And, then, and thriving <laughs> or beginning to thrive. And, and then uh, Thursday and Friday of next week, World Gospel Mission board meeting. Sunday a week, I'll start a revival with a young man I'm trying to recruit for WBS. Don't tell him. I'm trying to recruit him as a student. <laughs> He's a brother-in-law of Savannah's. And uh, so I'll be in Clinton, Tennessee with David Spies. So don't tell him. I'm trying to recruit him. Be, you know, keep secrets. I'm going to go in from the back door. So that's, it's good. Thank you. I know how the boy thinks. So I, I often go back to the main thing. And the main thing for Wesley Biblical Seminary is our mission. And I want to address one portion of our mission this morning, so I read to you our mission. Wesley Biblical Seminary exists to advance Christ's kingdom through the church and make disciples of Jesus Christ by offering life-transforming theological education, producing spirit-filled shepherd theologians and leaders for the 21st century who demonstrate an unwavering commitment to Trinitarian faith, Christ-centered holiness, biblical authority, and personal accountability. And it's the last one that I want to talk about this morning, personal accountability. And to do so, I want to take you to 1 Kings chapter 1, looking at the, the narrative surrounding Adonijah, Prince Adonijah, the son of King David. Now, King David was old, advanced in years, and they put covers on him, but he could not get warm. Therefore, his servants said to him, let a young woman, a virgin, be sought for our Lord the king and let her stand before the king and let her care for him and let her lie in your bosom. 
that our Lord the King may be warm. So they sought for a lovely young woman throughout all the territory of Israel and found Abishag the Shunammite and brought her to the king. The young woman was very lovely and she cared for the king and served him, but the king did not know her. Then Adonijah, the son of Haggath, exalted himself and said, I will be king. And he prepared for himself chariots and horsemen and 50 men to run before him. And his father had not rebuked him at any time, saying, why have you done so? He was also very good looking. Brother of Absalom, remember. They shared the same mama. His mother had borne him after Absalom. Then he conferred with Joab the son of Zeruiah and with Abiathar the priest and they followed and helped Adonijah. But Zadok the priest, Benaiah the son of Jehoiada, Nathan the prophet, Shimei, Ray, and the mighty men who belonged to David were not with Adonijah. And Adonijah sacrificed sheep and oxen and fattened cattle by the stone of Zoholeth, which is by in Rogel. He also invited all his brothers, the king's sons, and all the men of Judah, the king's servants, but he did not invite Nathan the prophet, Benaiah, the mighty man, or Solomon, his brother. Lord Jesus, I pray that you would anoint your word this morning and speak it to our hearts. Help me, grant me utterance, Lord. And you know where each of us needs to apply this truth. As we seek to walk in the light of it, guide us, Lord. For Jesus' sake we pray, amen. I want to talk to you about Adonijah this morning with a simple title, When Accountability Does Not Work. <laughs> when Accountability Does Not Work. Now you see when I do that, I'm arguing the negative. And it's, a, it's called in rhetoric, a strategy to overcome disbelief or how to confront a hostile audience. <laughs> you all are not hostile to this thing. But it's arguing the negative, which is an appropriate way to approach argumentation uh, if it's used from time to time. And so as we look at it, let's consider this theme when accountability does not work. A number of years ago, some hungry-hearted young men that I was working with at Kentucky Mountain Bible College when I was a vice president for student life there formed an accountability group. And for most of the young men in the group, accountability worked, and it worked well. But there was a young man in the group for whom it was a failure. Most of the men really wanted help. They wanted to be honest. They wanted to su the support and encouragement of the group. They wanted to live a holy life. They wanted a transformed life. But one had a different agenda. I'll call him Paul. The names are changed to protect the guilty. Paul's agenda was weak. His agenda was about protecting himself. He used his accountability group as a Saturday night confessional without any appropriate penance or transformation. And accountability can be used and abused in that fashion, and he did. He'd go home on the weekend, he'd visit his family and his girlfriend, and we returned to campus. He met with his accountability brothers. Weekly, he confessed his habitual and escalating moral failure, his moral compromises with his girlfriend, which were advancing each week. Weekly, his classmates and his dorm mates encouraged him, reprimanded him, tried to correct him, tried to challenge him to holiness. He loved the attention. But nothing changed. He continued in his sinful pattern, weakly using his accountability group as a personal confessional to assuage his guilt without any effective change in his lifestyle. When his sin was ultimately exposed, he seemed to be repentant. I really think he tried to repent. He married. I did his premarital counseling. I thought that he had really repented. He graduated from Wesley Biblical Seminary. He went into pastoral ministry. He became a lead pastor for several churches. Then he joined a staff of a church as an associate for youth. He was hugely popular. Everybody loved him. In the summer, he could preach five and six youth camps a summer. He was in demand. But it was all a masquerade because under the surface, there was a double life. He'd go back and visit his cousins in another distant city, and when he'd visit them, he'd smoke some weed with them. And he'd get drunk with them. 
and he'd save up his money and hide from his wife what he was using the money for from the revival meeting. She'd never see a cent of it. Their two sons would never see a cent of it. And he'd spend a wild weekend with whores in a hotel in a major city. It eventually came out. For, for Paul, accountability did not work. Why not? So I fled to Scripture, and in fleeing to, fleeing to Scripture, I asked myself the question, why did accountability not work for Adonijah? And are there some lessons there for you and me as we ask that question? And for Adonijah, account, accountability did not work because he was trying to hide something. Accountability did not work for Adonijah because he sought accountability from people of weak character like his own. And accountability did not work for Adonijah because he was plotting a treachery. And in our lives, accountability will not work if we're seeking to hide something. If we're seeking accountability from weak people of weak character with the same weaknesses as our own. Or if we're plotting some treachery. Think about Adonijah. David the king was old. Adonijah was an ambitious, treacherous young prince. He was a proud prince. He was ambitious for the throne, and his raw ambition would be his own undoing. He engaged in a treacherous plot. He influenced General Joab, priest Zeruiah. In an unvarnished grasp for power, Adonijah co-opted and corrupted the role of priest, and get this, he committed the sin of Saul. by pretending to be the priest of God and offer sacrifice for the people. He declared his self-appointed ascendancy to the throne, his royal reign, even before his daddy was dead and in the ground, six feet under. As Hugh Munson would have said, pushing up daisies. He didn't wait. He did not invite his father, King David. He did not invite the bold, courageous Nathan the prophet, for whom I name my own son. He did not invite Benaiah. He did not invite David's, any of David's other 30 valiant men. He did not invite the king in waiting, his brother Prince Solomon. He did not invite any of these strong people of strong character and integrity to the inauguration of his self-proclaimed kingship. You see it? Upon learning of Adonijah's ambitious scheme, David declared Prince Solomon to be his successor. And you see that in the first, this narrative in the first two chapters of 1 Kings. So Adonijah fled to the tabernacle. And I've never been able to understand. He fled to the tabernacle and he grabbed hold of the horns of the altar. Apparently proceeding from the altar of sacrifice at tabernacle were these horn-like features. And he laid hold of those and held on to those protesting and, and pleading for his life. And we use the expression in prayer to lay hold of the horns of the altar. You ever heard that? You ever said it? And the only times I see it in Scripture are with two men who get killed. <laughs> and I'm, I'm not sure why we use that metaphor for earnest prayer, but nevertheless we do. So he laid hold of the horns of the altar and prayed and had a plea for, in a desperate quest for survival. Solomon granted that request temporarily. He said, go home. Until later, Adonijah requested the hand of Abishag the Shunammite from Bathsheba. And Abishag the Shunammite, who had been King David's nursemaid, receiving her as his wife would solidify Adonijah as the front runner for the king. It would be a significant symbol to the whole Hebrew community that Adonijah had the favor and once Solomon learned of that, he had his brother executed for trying to wrest the throne from him. You see, he, Adonijah was surrounded by unwise counselors. He had priest Abiathar, who proved to be an unwise counselor and was exiled. He had General Joab, who proved to be a treacherous counselor. He too fled to the horns of the altar at the tabernacle. And he was executed right there on the spot by Prince Solomon and his emissary. Adonijah had advisors without accountability. And friends, we can have advisors without accountability in our lives. Each advisor had his own agenda for supporting Adonijah. 
Joab was consistently at odds with King David. He was always seeking the most radical, harshest agenda. He wanted to cut people off, and he wanted to kill people and show no mercy. You remember, Absalom died at his hands. A hardliner. Joab always counseled David to enact a more extreme enforcement against his offenders. And Joab reaped what he had sown. Prince Abiathar was weak, easily influenced. He reaped what he sowed. They didn't provide accountability. They were advisors with account- without accountability. So why did accountability fail for Prince Adonijah? Accountability fails when we're seeking to hide something. And so was Adonijah. Prince Adonijah was operating in secret. He was plan- planning an insurrection. He was consorting with counselors, plotting for position. He was promising power and prestige to priests and generals alike. And all the while, he pulled himself out from under the authority of his father, the king, and his brother, the heir apparent. And I found in my life, when I begin to step out from under the umbrella of authority, I am setting myself up to destroy me. There have been many occasions where I've had to flee back under the umbrella of authority. Prince Adonijah had a selfish ambition to seize the throne. Do you remember Anthony Weiner? It was 2011. He had had a successful career as a representative from New York to the U.S. House of Representatives. He had a 12-year career, a marriage to Hillary Clinton's personal assistant. His life and career hit the skids, though. He lied, he denied, and then he tried to hide. And it'll get you in Dutch every time, as Mama used to tell me. He tried, he had to resign in shame because of a personal scandal surrounding a Twitter sexting scandal. Selfish ambition and a lack of accountability and an inability to recognize truth when it confronted him face to face destroyed Anthony Weiner. And so too Prince Adonijah was destroyed by shame and selfish ambition. He lied, he denied, he tried to hide, and a lack of genuine accountability destroyed him. Greg was a student of mine in Kentucky Mountain Bible College. I loved him. I invested in him. I remember he had come out of a background where he had been incarcerated, and he had been convicted of a crime as a teen and then he had been released, I think he was 18, he had been released from prison and was very interested in following the Lord. He had found uh, a conversion experience in prison, and so he came to Bible college. He really was tracking well. He was hungry-hearted. I remember when Greg came to me, and he said, Dr. John, he said, I need to talk to you about my background, and he poured out the brokenness of having been molested by a man as a child. And may I just say to you, everybody's broken, only in different spots. And as long as we stay under the flow of God's grace in our lives, he will heal us where we are most broken. But the moment we put ourselves out from under that stream of grace, we will break ourselves in the same spots and worse all over again. Everybody's broken, only in different spots. So Greg confided in me and I counseled him as to the abuse that he had endured and loved him and invested in him. And when he started dating the lady he would marry, he brought her to me and he said, would you, would you do our premarital counseling? And so I did. And we talked honestly and openly about what he was grappling with from his childhood. And there seemed to be healing and empathy from the, his soon-to-be bride. And so they married. They were in ministry and some in some small churches together where Greg was a lead pastor, and they had a couple or three small boys. Greg invited me to come to the conference where he had been promoted in some leadership with the men's organization over in Alabama. And so I went to that conference. It was a men's conference. And I taught very clearly and very simply and very directly. And I addressed issues that men grapple with just as plainly as I'm addressing things this morning even more so. And so as I did, I I enjoyed being with Greg, I enjoyed seeing his wife and children. 
But apart from my knowledge, Greg began to get discouraged. And as he got discouraged, he fled to an old friend. He fled to online pornography. He had moved churches from Alabama to another state, and he fled to an internet chat room. And in the internet chat room, he saw what he thought was a 14-year-old girl, and he began to proposition her and flirt with her. And within days, his state organization of the Federal Bureau of Investigation was knocking at the church office door and arrested him from there and took him to federal penitentiary, awaiting trial. He plea bargained. He was allowed for time served, and within two years, he was out. Greg called me last winter. He'd paid a high price. His wife had divorced him. She had moved 2,000 miles away with the children. She's remarried now, and so he's seeking rehabilitation with his denomination. I pray that God will allow him rehabilitation. But here's the kicker. All throughout his spiral downward, he had an accountability partner. A college friend who was a pastor. A good accountability partner. But guess what? His accountability partner called me in tears. Greg never told me. I didn't know anything like this was going on. And for Greg, accountability did not work. It did not work because he was seeking to hide something. And accountability will not work when we're seeking to hide something. Remember it, everybody's broken, only in different spots. And as long as we stay under the flow of grace, God will keep us healed and whole right where we're broken. But the moment I pull myself out from under that, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to destroy myself in the same spots and worse all over again. And you know what those spots are for you. Accountability doesn't work when we're trying to hide something. Accountability does not work when we seek accountability from weak, people of weak character like our own. General Joab was a treacherous counselor. He was willing to betray mercy, betray David, promote his own agenda. Prince Abiathar, or priest Abiathar rather, represents a weak and indulgent counselor who enjoyed the emotion of success but was easily swayed by the lights, the grandeur, the popularity of public opinion. Prophet Nathan represents courage, confrontation with truth, commitment to the right, uncompromising. His wise counsel was shunned. It wasn't sought out. He was ignored and cast aside. And I can imagine that in the popular jargon of the day, he was known by Adonijah and his cohorts as an old fogey. You don't want to get that old man involved. <laughs> the mighty men of David represent fidelity and loyalty that is uncompromised cannot be bribed, cannot be influenced. Their wise counsel was shunned, as was their military authority. Prince Solomon represents wisdom and anointing, which is always shunned by treacherous people of weak character. His wise counsel was shunned, as was his familial and governmental authority. Accountability does not work when we seek accountability from people with the same weaknesses that we share. Accountability does not work when we're plotting some treachery. It was about rebellion. And Prince Adonijah was interested in seizing the throne. He wanted the authority of his father, the king. And he sought to get it, and he was going to stand on whatever weak people's backs that he needed to, to get there. He con had showed contempt for the sacrifice of God. He profaned the holy. He committed the sin of Saul. He offered sacrifice. That was not the duty of the king. Or prince. And that was the duty of the priest. The sin of Adonijah. In a moment of self-serving, self-indulgence, he sought to influence Bathsheba, Solomon's mother, and manipulate her. And she was suckered in by it. 
And out of her compassion, she went straight to her son, the king, and he said, enough. And he issued a death sentence. Ultimately, Adonijah was not seeking accountability. All he wanted was approval. That's haunting to me. I'm talking to people as prospective trustees of Wesley Biblical Seminary. And one of the main things I'm talking to them about is I don't want people who are John's men, who are yes men for me, whose primary job is to have my back. If that's what you want to have on this as a trustee of Wesley Biblical Seminary, we don't need you. But we want people who will advance the mission. And in order to do that, guess who they're going to have to hold accountable? And that's tough. That's a pressure-packed seat. But that's the only way we're going to advance the seminary for the glory of God. You all with me? The moment it becomes about me is the moment I've committed the sin of Adonijah. And I cannot afford that. Accountability does not work when we're seeking to hide something. When we seek accountability from people with the same weak character as we share or when we're plotting some treachery. So when does accountability work? Let's ask that simple question. Two things, I think, about when accountability works. It works when I live transparently rather than defensively before God and somebody I trust. Someone has said, but too often we confuse love with permissiveness. It is not love to fail to dissuade another believer from sin any more than it is love to fail to take a drink away from an alcoholic or matches away from a baby. True fellowship out of love demands accountability. Accountability works when I live transparently. Accountability works when I engage someone I admire and fear just a bit to hold me accountable. Often we're drawn to people like ourselves, and so we are drawn to the same weaknesses that we have. But if we really want accountability, we'll be drawn to somebody in our lives who I don't want to disappoint them. And if I have to tell them, whew, Chuck Swindoll had these questions, and I'm sure you've seen them before, that he used with pastors in an accountability group. Have you been with a woman anywhere this past week that might be seen as compromising? Have you, any of your financial dealings lacked integrity? Have you exposed yourself to any sexually explicit material? Have you spent adequate time in Bible study and prayer? Have you given priority time to your family? Have you fulfilled the mandates of your calling? Have you just lied to me? And then the classic four questions that John Wesley always used in the, in the class meetings. What known sins have you committed since our last meeting? What temptations have you met with? How were you delivered? What have you thought, said, or done of which you doubt whether it be sin or not? What is it that you're trying to rationalize is okay? Tough searching questions. Tough searching questions. But you see, if we as a seminary, if one of our five pillars is this radical kind of personal accountability, we're going to have to grapple with this. And I know that some of you have been doing that a long time. And I applaud that. I believe in that. That's one of the reasons I believed in this mission and came here. because I saw that that was still intact. There's a story told by David Roper. It's the story of Homer's Odyssey and King Odysseus trekked in, in the fight of the Trojan War. King Odysseus left his son, Telemachus, in the hands of a wise old man named Mentor. Mentor was charged with the task of teaching a, the young man wisdom. And 2,000 years after Homer, a French scholar and theologian by the name of Francois Fenelon adapted the story in the novel Telemaque. And it enlarged on the character of Mentor. And Mentor soon came to mean 
a wise and responsible tutor, an experienced person who guides, advises, teaches, inspires, challenges, corrects, and serves as a model. The antebellum American statesman and senator from Massachusetts, Daniel Webster, wrote these words, my greatest thought is my accountability to God. My greatest thought is my accountability to God. It is mine as well. My prayer is yours. When I was a boy growing up, I often heard this statement. With privilege comes responsibility. Did you ever hear that as a child? With privilege comes responsibility. And that was a tool that mom and daddy used to motivate me to maturity. But may I add to that? With privilege comes responsibility. And with responsibility comes accountability. With privilege comes responsibility. And with responsibility comes accountability. But accountability didn't work for Adonijah. It didn't work for him. Because Adonijah sought to hide something. He sought accountability from people of weak character. Not really accountability, he just sought approval. And he was plotting a treachery. May that be a warning for you and me. I want to show you one more picture. I met Cassandra when she was a sophomore in high school, Mount Carmel Christian High School. I went to a Kiwanis banquet, and Cassandra was serving my table that night. Her bright eyes, and as they darted from one person to another, her infectious smile. This kid was just so winsome and attractive. And I found her engaging. Watched her graduate from Mount Carmel. She came to Kentucky Mount Bible College. She could sing like a bird. She was a straight-A student, smart kid, sweet kid, gifted. We had her own singing group for the Bible College. Beth and I loved her like our own daughter. She'd come and spend a couple of Christmases with us, and we included her in Christmas gifts, giving and receiving, just like our own kids, Gave her some money. We went to Lexington and she did her Christmas shopping so she could participate. She had an adoptive parents down in North Carolina. and Her adoptive parents really had not been supportive of her. They'd been, her stepmother was abusive. And she and my wife had some real empathy for each other. Cassandra had a birth family up in Michigan. She had been estranged from them for many years and during her course of Bible college, she, she came up to an issue in her life where she really needed to address some real accountability. She needed to open up, release some brokenness to God. And I remember the day I was nudging her forward to deal with her brokenness. And she shook her head and she said, I'm not ready to deal with that. She got in a dating relationship with a guy. He had a praying background, praying parents. She didn't have a praying background and praying parents. Because of the way she had grown up, she was a world-class manipulator. And she knew how to manipulate her sensuality to control people. And in that relationship, She manipulated with her sensuality and her boyfriend was led like a lamb to the slaughter. And the relationship blew up. They were still attracted to each other and they got together again. And It was bad. It was awful. I was a student life officer in a Bible college. Come on, you all with me? She was my student secretary. And it was the spring of 1999, and I had to do one of the most painful things of my life. Cassandra looked at me, and she said, Dr. John, I will have no respect for you if you don't suspend me from school. And I knew we had to. But 
I grieved. The impact of the decision I knew I had to make. I knew it was right. She left Bible college. She bounced around from a few Christian homes and then bounced back to Michigan and got reconnected with her birth mother and birth father. That was bad news. Shortly after she got back to Michigan, her birth father died of a drug overdose. He was in his 50s. Not long after that, the news from Cassandra was that she was shacked up with Tim, an ex-Marine. She had one illegitimate child by him, two illegitimate children. Then she married him, and he beat her, and he beat her, and he beat her. She divorced him. She had no money. He had all the money. And he got the kids. He killed her. The only way she knew how to survive was to use her charm, use her pretty smile, her attractive figure. And she got hooked up with the guy who was in the drug world, in the drug culture. And Sunday, I got news. That this she died of a drug overdose over two years ago. I'm not doing real well. I'm really not. I'm struggling. In my weaker moments, I grapple with temptations to feel responsible, and I know I'm not. But I'm not handling this real well. Because somebody I loved failed to embrace accountability. And it destroyed her. And I don't want to see it happen. I really don't want to ever again see it happen. I know that's the risk of engaging in the kind of ministry we're in. We're investing in people. And as long as there's life, there's hope. For years I took comfort in the fact that people are never finished. But what do I do now? How do I process that now? The only way I know how to process it is to surrender it to God. And trust Him with it. And then to pour my life into others. To pour myself into you and more you's and more you's. Are you all with me? To pour my life into people. Because people are all we can take with us to heaven. We can't take the mission of the seminary. We can't take the buildings. We can't take our degrees with us or our libraries. But we can take people. So let's pour into people. Yes, we'll be brokenhearted. Yes, we'll be disappointed. But let's keep pouring into people. The transforming power of Christ. Would you bow your heads with me? Lord Jesus, uh, so often we find ourselves in a spot in life where we have to admit we don't have all the answers. <laughs> I feel like I'm at the front of that line. But I just want you to know I love you, Lord. I worship you. I'm yours. I'm sold out to you, to the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. And no matter failures or disappointments we will persist in obeying and serving our living Christ. 
and we will seek to invest in people. Help us in our own lives, in our own worlds, to be people of accountability. As servants to others, as recipients of the loving service of others. And help us to prepare many, many people. Help us to lead them to you so you could prepare them to make heaven their home. For Jesus' sake we pray. We love you. We trust you. We will serve you no matter what. Amen.